everyone, and welcome to episode 19 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. During the medieval period, there was a lot of interest in writing down what was going on in the world for the sake of future generations. Scores of chronicles have survived from the Middle Ages, and they form a lot of what we know about it. With this wealth of material, you'd think it would be pretty straightforward to put together a picture of what happened, but there's one slightly massive problem with that, and that is that medieval people didn't approach history the way we do today. This week, I invited Dr. Lane Soberad to speak with me about medieval chronicles, especially that of Thomas of Eccleston, who he'll introduce us to in a minute. Lane is the program manager in the Department of Education at Texas Tech University, and his work focuses mainly on chronicles, although more recently Lane has been involved in finding ways for modern historians to share the past with our own future generations through the Texas Medieval Association. Here's our conversation on Thomas of Eccleston, what medieval people thought they should include in their history books, and how today's historians can help out tomorrow's through outreach. Thanks, Lane, for joining me to talk about medieval chronicles today. I am so happy to have you here. So thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I always appreciate talking uh, to a more general and public audience about these sort of things. Uh, Students are wonderful, uh, but I know there's a lot more people out there that are interested in medieval topics. So you were just at the International Congress on Medieval Studies, and you're talking about Thomas of Eccleston's chronicles. And I thought we should talk more about chronicles, how they're built, and what some of the problems are with them. So let's work with Thomas today. Who was Thomas of Eccleston? So he was a Franciscan friar. Uh, We call them the Brothers Minor, or the Friars Minor, excuse me. Uh, And they came to England in 1224, according to Eccleston's chronicle. Now, the Franciscans were a mendicant order. This comes from uh, uh, Latin root words, which which literally translate into something like uh, wandering around. And so the Franciscans are this group of friars who live a holy and sacred lifestyle, who are wandering around, and whose focus, according to uh, St. Francis at least, was to connect uh, with the people that they encounter in in their day-to-day lives um, and be an example of holy Christian life to them uh, so that Uh, The people they encounter will then lead more holy and Christian lives themselves. So Eccleston is a chronicler and a historian, um, but a Franciscan, first and foremost, uh, who provides us the only contemporary account of the Franciscans coming and dispersing and gaining new members in England from 1224 to around uh, the end of the 1250s or so. And so this makes him a unique witness to this period of Franciscan history uh, and to this period of English history, too. He takes a decidedly, uh, as you might guess, a pro-Franciscan kind of view uh, of them coming to England. Uh, If we look at other chronicles and histories of the time, the Benedictines and Cistercians, who had already been there for a while, uh, were not so keen on this new religious order coming in and encroaching on some of their territory. (laughs) So what my paper talked about at the International Medieval Congress this year was an evaluation of Thomas of Eccleston's Chronicle. And this is a general treatment because, as far as I can tell, Eccleston has not had a lot of research done about him or his work. Uh, There was an article two years ago in a a book uh, edited by Michael Robson, and that was it since its last translation since 1961. And there was a, a, a modern edition produced in 1951, and then nothing before that until we get back all the way to 1909 or 19, <laughs> 1917, right? So there's not a lot of work done on this, but he's this really unique figure that we have for the, for the history of the Franciscans in England. He's the only contemporary witness we have. So I thought that deserved special investigation and a call for more people to look at his work uh, and works like his that have been kind of historically or traditionally ignored. At least in Thomas of Eccleston's case, uh, it's because the prevailing opinion of his work is that he's a bad chronicler and a bad historian. <laughs> My first problem with this is that our modern sensibilities of what we think history or a recounting of the past should be built like is different than we see in the Middle Ages. Thomas of Eccleston is no exception. And if we look at his treatise, he does indeed call it a treatise, right? He calls his work a tractatus which we see in all sorts of medieval titles on various kinds of texts, from theology to bestiaries to historical texts. 
uh, and all sorts of things. So Tractatus is a world that everybody knows. And Thomas was educated uh, at Oxford and he lived uh, in London for a while. And so he was educated. And so more traditional words we would associate with historical works like chronica or historia were known to him. But this is not what he chooses for his work. He chooses Tractatus instead. Uh, and so at least for me, this is, this is a pretty clear indicator that if modern historians are looking at this thing like a chronicle or a history, we might be doing uh, Thomas a disservice by using our uh, kind of training as academics and our understanding of what a chronicle and a history should be uh, and placing that framework onto Thomas's work inappropriately because this is a treatise. It's an account. Um, it's a treatment. And so that's a much more general kind of framework we might be able to use for this. We're also frustrated by the fact that what we know about Thomas is what I've just told you. Uh, he tells us in his work that he went to Oxford and he lived in London and that he was a Franciscan. And that's it. That's all we got. <laughs> and so that makes it difficult for modern historians, too. And this may be another reason why nothing, uh, nothing really has been done seriously on him or his work. Uh, because when we look at, at, at modern translations or critical editions, usually the first uh, you know, 50 or 60 pages is a nice introduction where we learn who the author is, their place in a wider uh, historical context, uh, their, their historical milieu, and it, it, gives us, it gives us a starting point for looking at, at this particular text that the author produced. We have no such thing for Thomas of Eccleston. Um, so while we can place this thing within the wider context of Franciscan history— it's much more difficult to place Thomas uh, in particular within that Franciscan context. So what, what I looked at more specifically in the paper is breaking down this treatise or this work of uh, this historical work as we might a chronicle we've, uh, you've never looked at before, right? So how many chapters does it have? How many pages is it in a modern edition? How many manuscripts do we have of it? Uh, and then what are the major plot lines that we see in the chronicle? Um, or in the treatise, as, as we should probably refer to it. And so this is a short thing. In the modern translation, the, the modern edition has 104 pages, but a few of those pages include really extensive footnotes, and so we're probably looking at just under 90 pages, uh, which is very, very short for a 13th century chronicle. If we look at somebody contemporary like Matthew Paris, his modern editions run multiple volumes of you know 400-page books with extensive annotations um, and sometimes nice uh, illuminated capitals and things like this. Uh, this is not the case with Thomas of Eccleston. We only have four manuscripts. Two of them are complete. Two of them are fragmentary. Of the two that are complete, they include large sections of marginal editions. Uh, so that is text that is in the margin uh, of these manuscripts. Now, the interesting thing about these is that in the copies, these marginal editions, which in a, in a typical kind of manuscript, are, are often done by a different person than the person writing the main narrative. Uh, but at least in these two complete manuscripts we have with Thomas of Eccleston, they're done in the same hand as the narrative, uh, which, number one, suggests that these two were copied from something else, right? And so the copier is copying the marginal editions that are listed in the same way as the thing they were copying, and it suggests that Thomas of Eccleston is, is probably not done with this thing by the time he stops writing or contributing to it. Because it, even in the 13th century, we're not at a point where people are just putting things randomly into a manuscript. We have paragraphs and page numbers and sections and chapter titles and this sort of thing that's uh, not uncommon. But at the same time, the writing process occurs in much the same way as it does for us today. And so if you're, if you're writing a draft of something and you're editing this, you put a whole bunch of notes in between the lines or in the margin or this sort of thing, right? And so these two complete copies that we have with these large marginal editions suggest that Thomas of Eccleston's treatise that we have is a working copy or a draft. He wasn't finished with it. And so again, we return to this criticism of him as, as not a very good historian or chronicler. And this is another reason why I think that's kind of unfounded. If this was indeed a working draft, um, I don't think any of us want to be judged on, uh, on you know, the first or second draft of something that we write before we submit it to publication <laughs> or present it at a conference, it's going to look like a mess. I think Thomas of Eccleston is kind of treated unfairly in that respect. Sounds right to me. I was hoping you could clarify a little bit about sure. the difference between writing history in the Middle Ages and writing it now, because writing it now, um, there's kind of a very 
strict set of rules and that you're supposed to put in the things that you absolutely know and can be verified by other other things. But in the Middle Ages, it was a lot looser when they were writing history. So what kind of things would you find in a medieval history that you wouldn't find in a modern history? Well, this is interesting. And what typically happens in a medieval chronicle, and even more so once we get to the 13th and 14th century, is that authors start to talk to us about these sorts of things in the prologue, right? So, for example, in Thomas of Eccleston's uh, treatise, he tells us he spent 26 years collecting uh, the components of this chronicle, and he collected it from his most holy and, and dear brothers and fathers in the Franciscan order. So this could mean a couple of things. Traditionally, in a medieval chronicle, when they say, I collected this stuff from my fathers and brothers, or um, a very common phrase we see is, I collected this stuff from reliable witnesses, this means the information presented in the chronicle was provided to them orally. Right. So they went and met with somebody. That person told them a story. Hey, I went on crusade, and this thing happened to me when I, was, when, when I went on crusade. And especially if this person is of appropriate social or religious standing, so... Uh, for example, uh, uh, some, someone who holds some sort of uh, rank of nobility or someone who has a, a title like father or abbot or bishop. These people have appropriately high social status to be considered reliable. And thus, at least in a medieval mindset, the things they say can be legitimately argued to be true. This is, this is not the case, perhaps, for someone of lower social standing like a peasant um, or for medieval culture. Uh, oftentimes women are included in this category too, right. unless they were an appropriately holy uh, woman or a woman who uh, lived in a convent or was a particularly remarkable sort of noble woman. So that's one of the major ways that medieval history differs from modern history. So medieval historians could absolutely rely on those oral accounts from reliable witnesses. These days we have oral historians who collect things like this uh, but there's a much more intensive kind of interview and survey process that involves uh, formal data tools and survey methodologies and these sorts of things that medieval peoples did not use. The second way that medieval historians uh, might collect their stuff is by traveling around in a very similar kind of way that modern historians do to various places collecting documents, whatever kind of documents these may be. So these could be other historical texts. These could be administrative documents, they could be a collection of letters from somebody, could be sermons, papal decrees, whatever it happened to be. And in that respect, medieval historians are very much like modern historians, collecting documents, sifting and synthesizing the material and the content of those things, and arguing a particular point of view. What's much different in the way we, um, we modern historians use those versus medieval historians is that modern historians are required to do some kind of a uh, citation methodology whenever we include those sources, right? So you let the audience know where you got the thing from. So if somebody wants to fact check you, they can go straight to the thing that you cited and tell you, wow, that's really interesting. Or on the reverse, you didn't do your due diligence. You're wrong about that. And that's part of modern historical debate are things like that, right? Interpretation uh, and perspectives on sources. Uh, medieval peoples weren't expected to do that with the sources that they used. And so uh, just as we had reliable witnesses that were of appropriate social standing, so too did we have authors and writers of things that were appropriate to include in your historical text as um, something that could be relied upon. Papal decrees, for example, the Pope puts that out. That's the most reliable person, arguably, in the Middle Ages. But we could also look at their antecedents. So at least in English historical writing, for example, uh, the Venerable Bede, um, the first and arguably the most important um, historical author from medieval England. And he's cited in a vast majority of historical texts that are produced throughout medieval England from the time that he lives all the way through the 1500s and beyond. And so what a lot of authors might do in medieval England is copy a section of Bede, Bede's ecclesiastical history. So this is his history of how people arrive to pre-medieval ancient England. He goes through the ages, and then eventually we get to the conversion of the English people, the conversion of the English people and the Christians. I'm getting a little off base here. Um, <laughs> That's okay. But the point of all of this is, if you're a person writing later in the Middle Ages, one way you can provide yourself some legitimacy is by putting Bede at the front of your text. Because everybody knows that Bede is reliable, and he writes the best history. And so if you can include Bede, 
your audience knows you have at least done a little bit of research on the best sort of person and you've used them as a source. Now, there's one tangential point here, too, which is about plagiarism. Uh, medieval peoples and historical writers in particular did not have the same views of plagiarism as we do uh, in modern historical writing. And so, for example, if you're going to include Bede in your history work, that's a good and appropriate thing to do. And you just copy Bede word for word and say, here's what Bede says about this. Boom, whatever it is you want to copy from him. And oftentimes we don't even see references to Bede, but the words are still copied verbatim. And that makes it very easy for us modern historians to go, oh, that chunk is from Bede. They copied it word for word. So if we come back to Thomas for a minute, um, Thomas includes a lot of things that would never be in a modern history, at least not one that would be, you know, passed through the academy. And that is that medieval chroniclers and historians, they exaggerated a lot of things, especially numbers, but they also included things that we would call supernatural now. And when you were looking through Thomas of Eccleston, you saw that there are actually quite a lot of supernatural or miraculous events. And that is another thing that kind of has damaged his credibility in the modern world. Is that right? Absolutely. So one of the major critiques of Thomas is that he includes too much supernatural stuff. And thus, these are not facts that we can verify or compare to other records that we have extant from the medieval past. Um, because it's things, you know, like a devil appearing and saying, I'm going to try and tempt the Franciscans by giving them money and women. <laughs> um, that's obviously not something that we can verify, right? <laughs> um, but this is not unusual in medieval historical writing either. Now, one thing to note here is the most popular and definitive dictionary in the Middle Ages uh, is a thing called the Etymologies, written by a guy named Isidore of Seville. Um, this thing exists in uh, thousands of manuscripts from across the Middle Ages and all across the medieval world. And so if you're looking for a good place to start for definitions of things, this is the place you start. Now, right. what Isidore talks about in the etymologies is that there are three kind of ways that historians usually present things. And these are fabula, right, fable, historia, history, obviously, and argumentum, which means literally plausible narrative. Uh, and depending on the kind of historical text you're writing, we apply one or all of these three in certain kinds of contexts, right? Um, so Historia, for example, is supposed to be used to provide a record of what Isidore says are deeds done. So things that people did, um, and we put those things in a particular order so that we can make sense of the events that happened in the past. Fabula is, is, is a fable. Right. So think Aesop's fable, because this is what Isidore says fabula is originally derived from. Right. Or, or things like Aesop's fables um, or parables we might find in the Bible. So these are things that the audience knows is not entirely true, but there is a good moral lesson to learn at the end of it. And thus, it's something worth including into a historical text. Right. So think about think about like Hollywood movies that say based on a true story. <laughs> right. Right. So this is the sort of thing that fabula is. But fabula also can include some uh, supernatural events, right? So talking animals or somebody miraculously surviving a fire or a saint's body who has been buried for 50 years, but they dig him up to move him to somewhere that's a little fancier and they find his body uncorrupted, right? And sweet smelling. Um, so these are the sorts of things we might include in, in fabula. And argumentum is in between those two. So real enough to sound like it could be Historia, but with elements that are, are I don't want to say silly enough, but questionable enough that they probably didn't happen, right? And so troop numbers are often something we could probably label as a component of argumentum, right? Uh, so when we read accounts of crusader armies, right? And so somebody had 20,000 cavalry units. That is way too large of a number, <laughs> or any sort of cavalry unit that medieval armies were putting on the field uh, at that point in time. But, but it means uh, really, really a lot. Yeah, and, but, and that's exactly what the author is trying to do, is they're trying to indicate there were a lot of guys on horses that were fighting each other. <laughs> uh, and so we see similar types of things in Thomas of Eccleston. And in particular, Thomas Eccleston tells us in the prologue, the reason he's writing is to provide moral examples for his fellow Franciscans in England because they didn't have other Franciscans in England to look to as examples at this point in time, right? Mm -hmm. So remember Thomas, uh, Thomas probably joins the Franciscan order um, around 1229-ish or so, 
we think. Again, it's not something we can really determine with any kind of definitiveness. So the Franciscans come to England in 1224. Thomas starts, joins in 1229, probably starts writing his chronicle a little, uh, a little bit thereafter. And so this is very shortly after the Franciscans had come to England. And so it's natural, of course, they didn't have a lot of examples to look to uh, from England. There is, of course, always St. Francis to look to as the example. Mm -hmm. And he pops up a couple of times uh, in the Chronicle, which is always nice to see. And so there are a lot of things in Thomas's Chronicle that are obviously not true, right? And so uh, true in the modern sense of the term. We also have to remember this is a medieval worldview where supernatural occurrences are absolutely a reasonable and rational part of the world that they lived in, right? Because this is the world of uncorrupted saints' bodies, saints performing miracles, people seeing visions that had implications for important things that were going to happen in the future. And so there's also an argument to make that even though there are supernatural things that occur in there, that we would consider empirically untrue or unable to be verified for the medieval people that are experiencing these things, they were absolutely true and had divine implications, and thus implications for their eternal well-being. And so those are things you should be paying really close attention to. So, for example, uh, one of the stories in Thomas of Eccleston uh, is that there is a brother who is walking from one place to another, as, as mendicant orders often did, and he happens upon a council of devils in the forest. And this brother tells Thomas, that when I saw this council of devils, they they were talking about how to lure the Franciscans into sin and depravity. And wow. they the, the devils decided that, well, the three best ways we can probably get these guys to sin is to try and give them money, to try and tempt them to lustfulness with women, and to send them bad novitiates, right? So bad uh, aspiring members of the Franciscan order, because if you had bad members— they're not going to be good at what they do until so the Franciscan order will fall apart or something, right? Yeah, yeah. And so the brother tells this to Thomas, and Thomas recognizes this uh, as a very good thing to include. Because if we look at the rule of St. Francis, uh, the three things that Franciscans are supposed to avoid are money, women, and interactions with bad sorts of people. Um, These devils and, knew what they were about. Exactly, right? And so that's an obvious and direct kind of uh, fabula and argumentum thing here, right? Where there is a clear moral message here directed specifically at Franciscans because of this connection between the things the devils were trying to do and these parts of the rule of St. Francis, right? Yeah. Uh, but there are other, there are other more uh, believable sorts of events where Thomas gets told about a dream that another brother has, where he... Uh, finds a pair of sandals as he was walking from one place to another, as Franciscans usually did. And Franciscans are not supposed to wear shoes because that is considered a luxury. And they are supposed to be living a life of poverty and asceticism, which means we, we eschew all sorts, of, all sorts of luxury, including shoes. But the brother puts the sand, these sandals on and goes, wow, these sandals are actually pretty nice. <laughs> and so the brother goes to sleep that night and he has a dream that he is set upon by robbers and the robbers are about to kill him and and take his stuff. When the brother pleads with the robbers in his dream, please, please don't kill me. I'm a Franciscan, right? Because killing the holy people that live a vocation associated with the church, that's generally frowned upon. And you're going to end up in the, in the place with fire and brimstone, right? Right, right? And the robbers say to the brother, well, you're no Franciscan, you're wearing sandals. And so the brother wakes up and immediately throws away his sandals and takes this as a divine message. As he and so, should. Is, yeah. And so this is something that could absolutely have happened. Uh, it's not unusual for people to have weird dreams about something. But what I want you to note here is that both Thomas and the brother in question associate this dream with some sort of divine communication. Mm-hmm. And so dreams are real in a sense to us as modern people, right? And all sorts of strange, you know, well, we don't want to get too much into Miss Cleo territory, right? right. But we, we, we view dreams as real in a certain kind of sense, but know that these are our mind doing weird neurological things as we're sleeping. Uh, this was not the interpretation of people in the Middle Ages. Dreams had important information we needed to pay attention to. And so the moral lesson, of course, is that if you're going to be a good Franciscan, you need to make sure you avoid luxuries, even something as simple as sandals. And of course, this goes right in line with the proposed purpose of Thomas of Eccleston's Chronicle. That is to provide good moral examples for his fellow Franciscans. Now, one final point I might make here 
is that one of the main reasons why Thomas of Eccleston's work is probably labeled a chronicle is that we see at the outset of a lot of medieval histories and chronicles um, in the traditional sense, statements by the authors that their works are being created for a very similar purpose. So I write these things uh, so that great and evil deeds are not lost to the obscurity of the past. Or as Augustine says, uh, we must plumb the depths of infinite memory to find those things we should remember um, that help us live a better, more holy Christian life. And so this could include kings doing, doing great things like winning some major victory for their people uh, and for Christendom or something like this. Hagiography starts off in much the same way where we're supposed to follow the example of the saints. And so when Thomas makes a similar sort of statement at the outset of his work, it's certainly not a misstep for people to go, well, this thing is, is obviously going to be a chronicle or a history. But I see his work more as a collection of stories, uh, not yet finished with a, with a complete narrative. Right. And I think that's fair and that it wouldn't be fair to apply our standards of history to the medieval past, because as you say, it is a totally different culture and the expectations of what should be in there and what shouldn't are totally different. Absolutely. Um, and it's one of the things that fascinates me about medieval history is, is trying to understand this drastically different view of how the world works and functions uh, and what we're allowed to do in it. And in the same vein, how these people try and craft their perspective of what happened in the past. Um, so one of the things I investigate, for example, or, or have investigated, is how a Christian medieval Europe incorporates a non-Christian classical past. They knew people like Cicero, uh, the, arguably the, the most famous uh, Roman orator and writer. They include people like Aristotle and, and Plato and people from classical Greece uh, and, and, and other parts of the classical world. But they don't mention things like God and Jesus and these sorts of things. And so for medieval peoples, how do we make those sorts of things make sense with stuff in the Bible? Right. So when Herodotus writes his history, which was known in the later Middle Ages, there's no mention of the creation story in the seven days or Noah's Ark or these sorts of things. But we know that Herodotus has a reputation of being as, as being a very reliable witness. So how do we reconcile those things? Um, and so we end up with very strange things. So, for example, one of the papers that I listened to at the International Medieval Congress was talking about an early medieval chronicle addressing or a 13th century chronicle that addressed the early history of medieval Spain. And it talks about the origins of the Spanish peoples. And what we see is Old Testament history. And then Hercules makes an appearance. <laughs> nice. Right. Uh, and if, if you know anything about Spain in the Middle Ages, you know, it's beset by all sorts of conflict um, and consternation between uh, different Spanish peoples uh, and then between Christendom and the Muslim world. And this chronicler in particular uh, attributes all of these bad things ultimately to Hercules, who came in and messed up the native inhabitants and the way they were living their life and set them down a bad path for the rest of history. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's that's one I haven't heard before. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't either, which is why I found it so fascinating. It's interesting how they reconcile these things, as you say, and it's probably an entirely new podcast, which I need to get to. Before I let you go, though, um, you're working on bringing medieval history in a more cohesive way to students in K-12 to across the United States, especially, and you're in Texas, so starting with Texas. So what are some of the ways you think that we can bring history better to the uh, classrooms in K-12? to Well, I have a couple of thoughts on this. Uh, number one, as an academic, the stuff that I produce that people read, scholarly work that I produce that people read, um, usually is a fairly limited audience, uh, and it's people like, like me who already have all sorts of training and experience studying things from the Middle Ages. However, the way most people in the general public and students are included here um, encounter the Middle Ages is through some other sort of medium. So Game of Thrones, a world history class they have in some sort of you know, K through 12 setting, or they see a documentary on the History Channel or on Netflix or something. And so one of the things I would like to do is to reach out to those sorts of people through uh, avenues like this. So talking to you is, is a great thing to do. Oh, thanks. Um, and to, to try and, and get more ears attuned to 
um, how people who are experts in medieval things interpret and understand the medieval past. Um, because there are a whole, well, I'm a little biased in this respect, but there are a whole lot of things in the modern world that I, I would argue have ultimately uh, medieval origins. The uh, college and university system, first and foremost among them, at least in my mind. Right. And so I want to make sure people are not only getting medieval stuff from Game of Thrones or a history documentary with bad, uh, bad green screen stuff in the background. Uh, <laughs> you know, colleagues of mine like Kelly DeRees who feature on those are usually very, very good and provide very good information. And so uh, one of the things I want to do in a K-12 setting uh, is I'm in a unique position right now. I work at Texas Tech University. Um, and I have transitioned from working in the Department of History, where I was a traditional academic, uh, to working in a college of education, where I am doing outreach and engagement to K-12 students, specifically targeting uh, the humanities, which medieval studies is typically included in. And so we want to focus on issues of writing and critical reading and literacy. And medieval topics have stuff that we can contribute to this. So we can look at Obviously, great works of literature, uh, like the Canterbury Tales. Uh, we can look at great works of history, like William of Malmesbury. And we can, we can talk about socio-cultural issues, too, that are still modern topics of debate, and how those compared to things in the past. Because that, that's going to affect how we interpret things now, right? Um, so things like medieval conceptions of race. Um, a large part of the group of students that I work with are first-generation college students or historically underrepresented uh, minorities. Um, and they have certain racial experiences that are informed by the things that they, they encounter in their everyday life. And we are trying to, I, I would like to communicate to them that medieval conceptions of race are not wholly different from our understanding of race in the modern world, uh, even though there are vast cultural, geographic, and chronological differences. And that these problems that they may be observing in the modern world were problems people were dealing with a thousand years ago, too. Right. And people right. had to overcome those difficulties or obstacles in their own context and historical setting, just as people today have to um, overcome those obstacles uh, in, in their own specific kind of experience. And so I'm doing a couple of things to help to help with these. Um, so one is supporting History Day initiatives. Uh, so National History Day is a federal program um, that wants students to engage the past critically. And so I am encouraging students and, and leading workshops and these sorts of things to encourage students to engage the past critically. I obviously promote uh, studying medieval topics for this. Uh, some of my other colleagues are promoting uh, their own fields. But the, the point is to get the students to engage meaningfully in the past and engage themselves in the work of real scholarly research. The second thing I'm doing is uh, I am beginning to work uh, with the Texas Medieval Association on uh, a few initiatives, one of which is the uh, Texas Medieval Association Out Outreach and Engagement Network. And what we would like to do is bring our faculty experts into a K-12 classroom. K-12 teachers, uh, on the whole, are overworked, underpaid, and lack appropriate resources, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the state of Texas. Some people will, will, will disagree with me on that, and I'm, I'm happy to talk to them about those sorts of things. <laughs> and, and so what we want to do is provide some of these teachers access to experts for their classrooms to engage their students, again, in, in a meaningful kind of way. And so it is unreasonable to expect a 10th grade world history teacher to be an expert in every ge geographic, thematic, and chronological field. It is impossible. And so we want to provide our experts to these classrooms in as many ways as we can so we can provide that expertise for them and help their students understand how the Middle Ages really was, rather than relying on a teacher who may not have uh, that much expertise in the Middle Ages, um, and that doesn't have enough time or resources in order to become an expert in that field. And so we want to take some of the burden off of them for at least medieval subjects uh, to help their classrooms out, whether that's through building lesson plans, whether that's through um, something uh, like this, where uh, maybe we talk to a group of students digitally, or whether it's providing a collection of sources or academic resources for use in the classroom. Right. So if people want to get involved with this, not just in Texas, but across um, across the United States or across the world, can they get in touch with you? 
Absolutely. If you go to texasmedieval.net, there is a contact form there. Uh, my email address, as well as the rest of the Texas Medieval Association Executive Committee, all of our email addresses are up there. Um, and anyone can feel free to contact us about anything that we might be able to help them with. One of our goals is to try and build a community of scholarship. And that doesn't just mean academic work. Um, that means students. That means K-12 teachers. That means public historians and public historical things, uh, like what you're doing here with this podcast. And consulting with television shows or movies or helping construct museum exhibits, right? All of these things can potentially benefit from collaboration with traditional academics. Um, and so we want to support those kinds of initiatives because if we, if we all can work together on these sorts of things, then I, I, that, that makes a more vibrant culture for everybody to participate in in the modern age. No, I absolutely agree with you. And thank you for your work, Lane. This is going to be awesome. And I hope lots of people get in touch with you about it. Thank you so much for being here to talk to me about Thomas of Eccleston and Chronicles and kind of the future of history. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Feel free to, to again, get in contact with me anytime. If you want to contact somebody else in the Texas Medieval Association, please just let me know. Uh, and I can, I can probably uh, finagle that for you. Uh, but thank you so much for what you do. This, this is hopefully going to help some people, uh, hopefully a lot of people, but I'll take one if it helps one person. <laughs> I'm sure it will. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Danielle. As Lane said, if you want to get in touch with him or get involved in the outreach projects he's working on with the Texas Medieval Association, you can visit texasmedieval.net. You can also follow the Texas Medieval Association on Facebook or on Twitter at Texas Medieval. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net. But before we talk about what's on the website, let's talk a little bit about our recent trip to the International Congress on Medieval Studies in Kalamazoo. So, Peter, did you have a good conference this week? Yeah, I did have a, I had a pretty good conference. Uh, I gave a paper on uh, battle speeches in Sphera Saga, which uh, uh, nobody hated, so that, that went well. And... <laughs> Uh, you know, a lot of good papers I heard, uh, uh, something about, uh, really one enjoyed about corruption with ferrymen in England. So that was kind of fun to, to, to listen in on, uh, anything for you that kind of stood out in the con Congress? You know, I went to a really great panel on leprosy and that gave me some ideas for the podcast and also talked to a lot of really great people that I'd like to bring on. So it's always a great time to go there and, you know, catch up on what's going on. Um, I think that you were really interested in what Cliff Rogers was doing this year, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, had a uh, kind of a, a research lab with uh, some of his students at, uh, uh, the uh, military academy that he's at and they were, did research on sieges in the hundred years war. So, uh, if you like, you know, kind of figuring out what, how many sieges there were and who won them and who lost and perhaps why, you know, that was, that was really kind of uh, pretty neat to kind of see all that kind of statistical evidence. So, yeah, that was a lot of fun. So, uh, Calmas is always a kind of a lot of fun for me. So Yeah, it was a good time. So, yep. what have we got on the website then? Okay, well, the website, because uh, we are at Kalamazoo, uh, it's, it was kind of a quiet week on the website, uh, but there's a really nice piece by Minji Su looking at the new film about Tolkien. Nice. Uh, so it's not a review, but more kind of uh, looking at some of the kind of things that are in there and kind of some of the medieval uh, ideas that are in the, in the, that they can put in. Um, we also have some news about Leonardo da Vinci, because uh, it's the 500th year of his uh, passing. And so he's making a lot of headlines right now. So there's kind of peace on that. Nice. Sounds good. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Here on the podcast, we're all about medieval outreach, spreading the word as best we can across the internet, across the world. Your support and patronage on our Patreon page really help us with this work. So thank you to all those who have already signed up. On our long drive from Ontario to Kalamazoo and back this week, Peter and I were cooking up all sorts of ideas for new reward levels, so stay tuned. If you want to get involved, go to patreon.com slash medievalists. To stay on top of all the latest news and scholarship about the medieval world, you can follow medievalists.net on Facebook or Twitter at medievalists. You can also follow me, Danielle Sabalski, all over social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. To spend even more time with me, you can find my books, including the one coming out later this year, on Amazon. 
As always, our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thank you for your part in sharing medieval history by listening and by telling your friends. Have an amazing day. Thank you.